Yeah, I have to go to uh, New York, and then I'm, I'll be in uh, Portland all next week uh, doing interviews with uh, with strange, wonderful people. So um, I'm going to be uh, suffering yet another dearth of content for my channel, and so we're just going to upload this thing. It's called Prioritizing Mindsets, What New York State's Culturally Responsive Sustaining Education Framework Gets Right by Pamela Dandrea Martinez and Evan M. Johnston. You can find them both on Twitter, at least Evan M. Johnston. He's over on Twitter. Um, and this, is, this, this article's uh, got a little bit of a dust-up going on around it, or at least the other writing that they're doing about this culturally responsive sustaining education framework. So what does it get right? Schools adhere to ideas of what is quote-unquote correct, the correct way to be, act, learn, and communicate. They institutionalize these ideas through school policies, teaching choices, and curricula. But these norms are not neutral or arbitrary. They mirror the norms that allow society's justification for why certain groups, such as white, middle-class, and cisgender people accumulate privilege, while groups such as black, trans, and disabled people accumulate vulnerability. That is wonderful. How do you accumulate vulnerability? I think they're talking about over time. So over time, there's these certain forms of education privilege those who master those forms of education, such as like white people learning math and engineering accumulate financial knowledge and the, the ability to engineer things over time. And that sets them ahead of these other groups that are denied the ability to learn math and engineering because it's not spoken in their way. It's not spoken to them. And that's kind of the whole thing about culturally responsive sustaining education is that it's trying to alter the ways in which education is adduced into the minds of individuals so that everybody has an equal chance. Well, how do you make math culturally uh, neutral? Well, first of all, you have to make it cultural. And so what they do is they declare math as a form of whiteness, or they, they declare testing as a form of whiteness. In order to destroy the system, to create a better system, they uh, attribute a racial characteristic to forms of knowing, to, to knowledge generation, to math and engineering and all these hard sciences. They're, they're Form, formulated in terms of race, and that allows these people to do that, to, dis, uh, to, to let go uh, or to overlook or to actually to justify the outcomes and the, the, difference, the differences in the outcomes of these different groups. If you look at the statistics, you'll see that certain groups are you know, falling behind other groups. And so they want to say, it's not necessarily the cultures or the gaps that are the problem. It's the way that we're looking at these gaps that are the problem. But let me go forward. When schools establish norms that uphold privilege and vulnerability, they yield inequitable outcomes. Culturally Responsive Sustaining Education, CRSE, provides a lens to study the way schools are complicit. They like that word, complicit, in structuring social imbalances and through reflection and practice can work with communities, families, and students for educational equity. While CRSE has... Yeah, CRSE has associated practices. It is not a set of ready-made strategies for schools to simply adopt. So again, you are kind of, just like with the Evergreen stuff, you are thrust in this, um, this very nebulous sort of wrestling with these ideas that are not made concrete. And any sort of movement towards the concrete is called out as a form of knowing that is trying to implement a norm, such as like, what is the logical... Um, you know, consistency of these arguments. Well, logical consistency, that's a form of whiteness. That's a, they, they racialize that in order to dissuade one from being able to attach like solid um, ways of, of looking at the problem and, uh, and of solving the problem. And without that concreteness, they can thrust you into this eternal, never-ending soup of just working out these different ideas and just kind of swimming around in these ideas. And so they can kind of basically critique you like you're not dancing correctly or like make this whole thing up like a dance. So you just you have to kind of feel it out and move in the right way. And they will sculpt how you go. They will give you these kind of indications of how you should and shouldn't do, which we'll get to in just a moment. Consider two hypothetical math teachers, teacher A and teacher B, working in the same school implementing the New York 
uh, SED, uh, school education, critically responsive, uh, sustainable education framework. Both teachers say they believe all children can learn. They each have seven years of experience teaching in schools with black, Latin, X, indigenous and white students. White is the only one not capitalized and whiteness and the white gaze is not capitalized either, but every other racial group is capitalized. So that's a sort of normative statement that they're saying that, that white is just the, the, the sea that you, that you walk through and swim through and breathe. Like it doesn't need a uh, definition, a definite definition because it's everywhere. It by its very nation, it's, it is by its very nature, even though explicit in all these ways, it's very implicit everywhere. So they, they make it obscure when they want to and they're really exact and they use that obscurity to um, undermine any sort of explicitness while being very explicit with the var marginalized groups, with vulnerability, even though they just say people are vulnerable and then they point to the gaps, but then they say, you're not supposed to look at the gaps. Anyways, it's, 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 just, it's a total mind F-U-C-K. By drawing a comparison between teachers A and B, we suggest that change in education happens in the heads and hearts of educators before it happens in their hands. See another, like they use like a poetic turn of phrase uh, to make us kind of seem like we get what they're saying and that they know what they're saying. But what does that mean? We suggest that change in education happens in the heads and hearts of educators before it happens in their hands. Well, let's go forward. Teacher A, well-intentioned and caring, but complicit. What does complicit mean? Guilty, basically. You're guilty of all the sins of this entire system because you're not working against it. Teacher A believes in the achievement gap and decides to tackle it by focusing on what their students of color, capital S, capital C, can do to better succeed. They plan to bridge this gap with CRSE. Caring deeply about their students, Teacher A notices their students are into hip hop. They decide to make the day's math lesson more relevant to their students by adding hip hop to the lesson plan. They take a popular song that they hear students in their class playing, but switch the words of the song with math content. This way, they hope students will better memorize the content and be better prepared for the tests. I.e., hello kids, I like big maths and I cannot lie. You other brothers might deny that when a big hungry set walks in, you get wet. I don't know what they would do, but they're basically, that's kind of the example, right? To continue, this teacher cares, is paying attention to students, and is trying. However, they have not fully grasped CRSE because they still see the student as the problem, broken and needing to be fixed. Their inclusion of hip hop does not sustain their students' cultures. It uses a surface level part of culture to further a white centric paradigm of education focused on testing and a pedagogy of remediation. I need to look up remediation really quick, um, even though I know that it's not gonna make sense, but the dictionary definition of remediation is the action of remedying something, in particular, a reversing or stopping environmental damage. So a pedagogy of remediation would be trying to solve or fix the students. And in that context would be trying to get the students to learn math and using the student's culture to uh, implement mathematical knowledge or to get the students to at least mouth the words of math. And then hopefully some of those students will take the next step of letting go of hip hop and embracing math itself. But that would, by definition, erase their culture because they would be stepping away, they would be stepping through hip hop into another uh, white centric world of numbers. Well, let's find out. CRSE does not buy into gaps because it disrupts the premise of achievement. Wait, what? Okay, CRSE disrupts the premise of achievement. You disrupt the premise of, what is, what, the, what is the premise of achievement? Like good job, like you actually did something that matters or you, you proved that you're a master of something? We wanna disrupt that. We wanna disrupt mastery. 
Ergo, why even have education? Education is about learning a skill. If you get rid of skillfulness, how does education matter at all anymore? You're just taking a bunch of government funds and you're babysitting students and then you're fudging up the numbers or saying that the numbers don't even matter so that I don't know what, you're, you're implementing a different way of knowing. Uh, probably this Rousseauian Marxist way of knowing comes into the place of what stands for knowledge, which just goes around critiquing the world in this one form of knowledge. So this culturally responsive education is in fact its own form of knowledge that is trying to colonize education in order to turn education into all about it. That's just my premise, but let's go on. Anyways, CRSE does not buy into gaps because it disrupts the very premise of achievement. Exchanging deficit views of students with placing students as both the starting and ending places of learning. What does that actually mean? That, what does that actually mean? Placing students as both the starting and ending places of learning? The knowledge is outside the student and you put the knowledge into the student, but that way of thinking centers knowledge, not the student. So the student needs to be moved from a state of ignorance into a state of knowing, but that knowing will disrupt the, the, that, that is actually, they're trying to disrupt that moving from ignorance into knowing and then the ways that we assess knowing because they're saying that all of those assessment tools are based on this white system that distributes privilege and vulnerability because of its inherent racist, capitalist, uh, normative makeup. Anyways, I'm sorry. Let, let's just let them speak for the moment. Exchanging deficit views of students with placing students as both the starting and ending places of learning. When inequities arise, that means when people, when different students are ahead or behind each other, when there's, when there is a difference in the skill of two students, CRSE names them what they are, names these inequities as racism, cis heteropatriarchy, settler colonialism, white supremacy, and ableism, viewing the challenges we face in education as historical as opposed to individual. Again, when inequities arise, when one student is ahead of another student, and there is an inequity in that, CRSE names that gap as what they are. They say we name them as they are. No, they are naming them this. Racism, cis-heteronormativity, settler colonialism, white supremacy, and ableism. So every difference between every, every student, it is defining as this, this system of oppression. Every difference between every individual, every gap is not a gap. It is oppression and it doesn't come from the different uh, curiosity quotients or the capability quotients of any given student that the, the internal capacity to learn is not situated in the student. It is situated wholly in the system. The student, every student is absolutely purely the same. The only thing that makes one student or another is a system of oppression. I'm sorry, I just have to emphasize that point. That is not something that they learn scientifically. That is something that this entire rubric, which is being implemented in New York schools and a lot of other schools, but very explicitly in New York schools, is all about defining the problem with their conclusion. It comes with the conclusion and then it implements that conclusion on everything. And then what, well, what are you supposed to do with that? How are you supposed to remedy all this oppression in the system? Well, name yourself complicit or you get on the freaking canoe. Let's continue forward. The theory of change that a deep study of CRSE offers teacher A begins with the transformation of their mindset from a deficit mindset to a humanizing one. Uh, how does that, you know, I, they, they haven't shown how that uh, follows. They have not shown how seeing a gap as oppression is different than humanizing. Like, like, okay, no, what they're trying to say is that when you see oppression, you see the human individual. And when you see the gap, you're not seeing the human individual. You're seeing, um, you're seeing this masked form of oppression that is uh, rooted in systems or rooted in history. 
It has nothing to do with the individual. It has nothing to do with the, the individual family unit. It has no, nothing to do with the actual individual family. Through time, it's all about this huge cultural forces that are colliding. And how is that actually more humanizing? You actually, it completely contradicts itself. They're viewing the challenges we face in education as historical as opposed to individual. And then in the next paragraph, they say that when you see things as historical rather than individual, you are actually humanizing the subject. When you're actually doing the opposite, you're no longer seeing the individual human, you're, seeing, you're only able to see this, this force. Um, that, that's exerting its pressure on this poor, vulnerable, or privileged by no inherent capacity of their own, but deigned from this corrupt system, this, this in, infernal, sinful history, that's, what you, that's the only thing that you see, and that's what makes them more human. Sorry. Let's go on. <sighs> the theory of change that a deep study of CRSE offers teacher A begins with the transformation of their mindset from a deficit mindset to a humanizing one. With a CRSE lens in place, teacher A can begin to shift their practices and ultimately redefine student outcomes. How? They didn't tell us how. How do, how do you actually do that? This radical transformation occurs by locating the problem away from students and their cultures and placing it on institutional mindsets, practices, and policies, all of which they are defining as a culture. These institutional mindsets, practices, and policies, they're saying that's whiteness. And they're, they're saying, <laughs> don't look at these students and their cultures, look at this other culture, this one unified, uncapitalized W white culture. Let's go to example number two. Teacher B, critically conscious cultural sustainer. Okay, so teacher A is the well-intentioned and caring but complicit teacher. Teacher B is the critically conscious cultural sustainer. How, they, how do they deal with hip hop in the classroom? Teacher B studies the way their school and schools in general reproduces in a, inequity, not equality. So equity is equalization. It's Old Testament justice. It's eye for an eye. It's, it's robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. That's what equity means. You give up, you take from, from a group that you perceive as a head and you give to that other group. Or you marginalize that which is uh, dominant and then you dominate or you make dominant that which is marginalized. So you look and you, do, you look at the way their school and schools in general reproduces equity. So what you do is you see the inequities. You basically, you see the gaps. So they're saying, don't look at the gaps, but look at the gaps because everything is the gaps, but don't mind the gaps, but don't mind the gaps. Like look at it, but don't see it, but see it, but don't look at it. Literally, this stuff doesn't actually make sense. To continue. They understand, they being the critically conscious cultural sustainer, understands that part of studying the power dynamics that privilege some groups over others means studying their own cultural points of view. So you do a self-examination, examining how these points of view shape their teaching and perceptions of their students. Why, why would I see one student as more capable at math than the other? That must be my cultural lens. I'm bearing down this, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who's creating this inequity by seeing a difference in ability of these two students. Is, this is total gaslighting brainwashing. Uh, they understand, okay. In the same vein, they study their students' cultural ways of knowing and get to know their students' lives. Teacher B considers how all these things shape students' learning and how to use this knowledge to help each student best flourish in school. Please, folks, give us an example. Here it is. When Teacher B notices their students are passionate about hip hop, they ask students to relate aspects of hip hop to what they are learning in math. Okay, so instead of taking hip hop and appropriating it with math, you basically, you ask the students to find math in the hip hop themselves. Well, that seems actually a good idea. You give the students the work of finding math there, but how do you help the students to recognize math? You still have to impose upon their brains an understanding of math in order for them to find it, right? Basically what they're saying is manipulate the students into teaching themselves which is actually a good trick if you can do it. 
To continue, when students begin to bring up connections between musical rhythm and mathematical principles, Teacher B sees the opening for students to not only bring this cultural form into the classroom, but for the classroom to sustain this cultural form. What do you mean? Prompted by students, Teacher B makes hip-hop an interdisciplinary ongoing unit of study that shifts the locus of expertise away from the enterprise of whiteness, what do you, what? that is distant from their students, which would mean math, right? They're, they're using whiteness to mask up math, which is incredibly bigoted, incredibly bigoted, but they, they hide it between, behind all of this psychological twisty turniness and this thoroughly ambiguous, doesn't really make sense if you think about it, but if you think about it, you're actually being racist, so don't think about it, form of knowing. And so they hide knowledge behind whiteness. Okay, so if the students are supposed to use hip-hop to learn math, right, and then the classroom becomes a cultural sustaining hip-hop juncture, but math itself is the problem because it's whiteness, how do they actually integrate? How does this actually integrate? I don't really understand. Prompted by students, Teacher B makes hip-hop an interdisciplinary, whatever that means, ongoing unit of study that shifts the locus of expertise away from the enterprise of whiteness that is distant from their students. Maybe it's the way of going about math that doesn't have hip-hop in it is what whiteness is, not math itself. Away from the white gaze, oh geez, and away from the white gaze that would typically frame how we see and understand schooling. As, what do you mean by math? How does, how is the white gaze interfering with somebody's understanding of math? Is it the tonality in which math is presented? Is it because it's on a blackboard with white chalk or a whiteboard with black ink? Is that the problem? Instead of in hip hop, instead of in dance, instead of embodied in these, uh, you know, these culturally sustained forms of knowing, is that what makes it white? What exactly is white about math? <sighs> okay, away from the white gaze that would typically frame how we see and understand schooling, their shift in thinking would imply as well a shift in methods of teaching and learning. How exactly? Because hip hop in this classroom is not tokenized, but treated as a vehicle for and the object of learning, we can walk into the classroom, maybe swagger would be the better word, which is no longer teacher B's, but the classroom of the cultures of the students, on any given day and see hip hop culture authentically represented. For example, we might see students engaging in battling techniques, ciphers, or using word number art as class activities. We might see them leading discussions and explaining concepts as they are living them in ways that value not only their knowledge, but also their lives. So I guess it is just basically at the end of the day, it's just an aesthetic vermeer, uh, veneer over math. So math is still being learned, and, but the problem is I can understand how you can use rhythm to learn and to communicate um, arithmetic and, and certain forms of math. But like once you get into higher forms of mathematics, how is that, that, um, that aesthetic veneer going to accelerate or help deepen the understanding of the student? Um, I, I would like to see this in practice. I would like to see how all of this stuff actually outputs into an authentic form of knowing of the actual knowing, of actual math. And I wonder at what point is a student going to have to let go of their cultural understanding in order to engage just with the math or just with the bridge, let's say. Uh, to continue, teacher, B, uh, <clears throat> teacher B's students know that in their classroom, they do not have the compartmentalize, they don't have to compartmentalize their lived experiences, cultures, and learning. They know that their cultures are starting points for learning and that culture is a practice of learning itself. They never have to give up or turn off a part of themselves simply to assimilate and always unsuccessfully. What? and always unsuccessfully? Ouch! How little do they think of these children? That you will not be successful in math until, unless you, 
unless you obey your cultural norms. Like there's no way for you to actually get on board with any of this because your culture keeps you behind. Wow. Sorry. Okay. Um, they never have to give up or, or turn off a part of themselves simply to assimilate and always unsuccessfully into the default of whiteness for their students. know they can never be white. What the heck? You can never be white. Therefore you should never have to know math. You should never let go of your, like, this is just really extreme stuff. This sounds really extreme to me. This stuff is being implemented all over New York schools, New York city schools. Just to let you know. Teacher A's students likely enjoy their hip hop math lesson. However, there is an important difference between the teachers in their depth of understanding of how to be truly reflective and responsive to students. Teacher B begins with the recognition that they do not know something about their students and begins the process of teaching by learning more about them. Okay, so I, I, I kind of understand on a certain level that the teacher isn't going to be, sorry, the teacher isn't going to be so arrogant as to think that they know everything about the students or that they can just bring math to the students. You actually have to bring the students to the math somehow. So you have to understand that though you have knowing, which would be math, you also have ignorance, which would be the student's culture. And so you lay that ignorance out before the students to invite them towards math. But there's all these little different tricks that need to be weeded out of this, this framework in order for it not to get stuck in this vilification of whiteness, whatever that means, and this loss of resolution on the project of education, which would be gaining a skill. Once you gain a skill, then sure, you can use that skill in your culture, but if you can't let go of your culture, if the students can't let go of what they already know, how are they going to learn? If the students don't face their own ignorance with regards to the material, then how are they going to achieve mastery of that material? Well, you, you have to throw away mastery at all, which I totally disagree with them, that, that first move of them throwing away mastery. So there's a lot of different things that I find to be absolutely horrible, bigoted, and uh, you know, anti-educational um, that, that are wrapped up in this one kind of cool idea. Teacher A's students likely enjoy, okay, blah, blah, blah. What emerges is more than a single lesson or strategy, but a process of teaching and learning that centers students' interests and cultures. This practice reflects a mindset, which in the long term morphs into CRSE practice. What if like individual students of color come from families who really dislike CRSE as a framework and really are trying to discipline their students to learn the material so that they can master the material, therefore they can go forth and use their skills to master a part of the world or to get ahead of the world. What if a student of color is from a family who absolutely does not want that student to participate in certain forms of cultural interaction, right? What, what, what if that's the case? Well, you, 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 then I, I, I suppose that, that, that student's parents would be accused of trying to assimilate into whiteness or something like that. Being versus doing. There is a deeper distinction arising from these two hypothetical educators. We support efforts to spread the teachings of cultural responsive and sustaining education, such as those currently underway in NYCDOE and the statewide NYSED framework. However, the difference between success and failure of such programs will come down to whether they successfully result in a system of educators who see CRSE not only as something they do, but rather something they are. I don't do Christianity. I am a Christian. I don't have anything wrong with Christianity or religion in general. I'm just saying that these people are, it's, it's not just, it is in, by, by definition, it's indoctrination. You ascribe to an orthodoxy and then you put it into practice, right? Orthodoxy, which is right knowing and orthopraxy, which is the right practice, right? It's a full 3D, all senses enabled, all intentions, yoked to this educational experience. So you don't just do this thing, you are this thing. So not only is it one little good idea wrapped in all this crap, but then the crap is wrapped in this authoritarian, totalitarian, religious theocracy, kind of like you, you, you believe and then you're saved, right? 
Teacher A in the example above does cultural responsiveness the way they understand it. They see CRSE as a set of practices or changes to practice that they implement like a checklist. Therefore, teacher A will improve their classroom library by making it more diverse, will display more student work, and perhaps create space for one or a few multicultural events during the school year. By ticking enough boxes, they will feel confident that they've done cultural responsive adequate cultural responsiveness adequately and will look to grades and test scores as indicators of whether CRSE has an effective program. Don't look at the gaps. Don't look at any data that would show you the gaps. This isn't something you prove or disprove. This is something you believe and are. This is something that you believe and are. Don't, don't look at it as, as a set of practices or as a set of tools. This is an entire system of being. What's that word? Ontology. This is an ontological existence, but not even a practice anymore. Okay. Teacher B, on the other hand, is culturally responsive and sustaining because they understand that CRSE is more than an initiative. They recognize that it is a mindset that pervades all of all their thinking from students' relationships to instruction to the nature and purpose of education. Teacher B knows that students from vulnerable groups have and will face greater obstacles to their own success. Are you sure? Every single one of them. Are you sure? Every single one of them. Every single white student is privileged. Every single other colored student is not. They're all, they're all the same in that difference. It's frustratingly low resolution mindset wrapped up in this like so high resolution, ambiguous like uh, hoot nanny that it, I don't see how this is going to last. I don't see how this is going to work itself out. Anyways, Teacher B knows that students from vulnerable groups have and will face greater obstacles to their own success, including in school. And not only works to remove those barriers, but teaches and supports students to recognize, organize, and successfully challenge systemic barriers whenever they face them. Okay, so you don't master the skill, you try to master the system. What does that lead to? That's basically the activist mindset. I'm not going to change my life, I'm going to change the world. Because it's the world's problem. I am the world's problem. The world is not my problem. It's the shifting of the locus of intent and agency away from the individual onto the system. And that leads to a whole system of behaviors where the student is never actually mastering anything other than the system, which would be bureaucracy, which would be knowing how to gum up the works and knowing how to manipulate the system to get what you want. Never forging a new system, never actually engaging with the world in a way where skill is and, and merit, I'm sorry, where, where merit is, is the rubric by which you know that you own what you do. No, you never own anything. You have to take everything else because everything was stolen from you, right? Or everything you deserve. You are basically entitled from this system, from life, to get what you want, get what you need, right? That, that, and that whole, that, that it's a whole cascade of creating and sustaining a, a bunch of, uh, of uh, basically, uh, uh, parasites upon the system. Right, and then call, and then furthermore vilifying everybody who's getting ahead of the system or who's forging new systems as somehow evil, white. Right? It, it's it's a horrible, it, like the the cascade of thinking. That's what I see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Teacher B knows that test scores are poor measures of the success of an initiative because of the deeply and historically problematic history of racial, linguistic, and cultural bias in the creation of norming of tests. Basically, that is basically didn't do nothing. I didn't do anything wrong. I, it, it's not me that's stupid. It's the test that's stupid. And, and, and furthermore, I'm not the one being bigoted. This is entrenched bigotry done up as casting actual responsibility or tests or evaluation as the source of bigotry or as the source of failure. I didn't fail the test. The test failed me. How does that work out with doing anything real? How does that work without, how does that work with doing anything in the world other than manipulating systems to get what you want out of them? That's the only, this skill is one skill, which is the imposition of what you want onto other people. That's the only skill that you're, that you end up getting by this rubric of education. Instead, to continue, instead, 
Teacher B assesses their own effectiveness by asking students for feedback and by reflecting on their lessons, relationships with students, relationships with family, and whether they feel a fulfillment, fulfilled sense of purpose in what they do. What the heck does that have to do with teaching math? Don't look at whether or not the students actually learn math. Look at if I was, if I was the correct kind of teacher. If, did I make bonds with the students? What if a student doesn't want to be your friend? They just want a skill to get ahead in the world. What if a culture doesn't want you to coddle them? What if? Ultimately, this is the most important distinction between some some between what some perceive CRSE to be and what it is. CRSE is a mindset, a way of being that permeates all aspects of the way a teacher thinks about what they do and how they do it. It is not a defined set of practices. It is not a curriculum. It is not a packaged product. It is an ongoing ethic of care and accountability to students and families. It is a mindset and CRC initiatives support teachers in cultivating and sustaining that mindset throughout their practice, even when it asks that they upend some of the ways they were previously trained or taught to think. CRSE is not an add-on to existing teaching methods. CRC is a deconstruction and reconstruction of thinking about education to center all students, whatever that means, rather than figuring out how to force vulnerable students towards the dominant student center. Good. God. To push forward, sometimes we need to get out of the way. NYSED CRSE framework is a powerful Oh, New York Steinhardt Education, uh, which is the, where all this stuff is coming from. If actually you look at the New York Steinhardt Education, I'll put a link down there. They, they're very explicit about blaming everything wrong in the world on capitalism, on whiteness, and on uh, people making babies, what, which they call cis-heteronormative behavior. And they say that the, they actually explicitly say in their documents that every individual is born perfect and it's society that corrupts them, which is a Rousseauian idea. Anyways, this framework is a powerful starting point in the project to rethink our schools. This rethinking centers students' lives and identities. However, it can only go as far as those who are asked to implement it, right? So it has to be everything, but it can only go f so far. It, it, like they're setting up a cult. They are setting up a cult. Um, and, and there's already like people are already kind of suing the New York uh, school education for, for not being on board with this and then being called out for being white or whatever. Like it's, it's actually setting up, setting up a lot of very be abusive behaviors on the level of the, democ of the, of the bureaucracy. So not only is it corrupting the, the ec educational project for the students and for the community, but it's also corrupting that entire system that's uh, eating up millions and millions of dollars, right? all due to um, the, the director, the chancellor, and uh, the mayor. Anyways, um, so it's not just, uh, okay, this rethinking centers students' lives and identities. However, it can only go as far as those who are, who are asked to implement it. Therefore, educators at all levels must be willing to stretch by shedding problematic and harmful pedagogies. So forget everything else. Every other way of knowing, every other way of teaching is off the table now. This is it, and this is everything. That stand in the way of a truly liberatory education. Liberatory from what? From skill. Stretching will also mean examining how cultural, linguistic, gender, and other biases based on their own identities can lead them to misperceive or mischaracterize students and their abilities in harmful ways. So this basically is going to solve everything. With these initial steps, educators can come closer to ensuring their view and treat students' whole lives as assets. As former teachers, we feel the urgency, the weight of bureaucracy that arises when a new initiative comes down the pipe. We understand the unrealistic pressure placed on teachers to have a game plan the next day to apply the new initiative. We also understand teachers and schools administrators calls for clear and concrete strategies and policies that will help them meet the new demands to get them from points A to B. However, 
No set of strategies and policies alone will make teachers or schools culturally responsive and sustaining because CRSE is not a one-size-fits-all prescription for educating students. It cannot be. CRSE requires tailored education and not education based on a preset list of strategies. It is a philosophy of education and not a lesson plan. What are you talking about? It's not something you can know, but it's the only thing you can know. Like this whole thing just, it's constructed out of bad ideas and constructed badly. And how it's, and how it's sustained is because there's just tons and tons of uh, that, uh, there's tons and tons of removal between these people and their ideas and reality. This comes to be because there's such a discrepancy from them ever having to take responsibility for how this will pan out, that they can just believe it wholeheartedly and push, push the outcome completely onto the system that they're completely corrupting and the culture and society that they're completely corrupting. They don't have any answers because it's, not, it's, a, it's a philosophy of education, whatever. I'm just going to rush to the end. Because we understand teachers' impulse to act, we caution educators that the adoption of CRSC framework must prioritize philosophical alignment with CRSC belief rather than a call for actionable steps or a pathway to doing CRSC. Don't do it. First believe. Don't think it through. First believe. First believe, ultimately, with or without a framework, culturally responsive, sustaining education will truly begin when you admit you're willing to change your mind. This is Benjamin Boyce. I will try to be back to you guys soon. This stuff is horrible. Links in the description. Like, subscribe, share with your friends. I hope you're great. I hope I'm great too. Be good. Learn a skill and better yourself.